The tricky thing about covering classic games is that oftentimes it can be quite difficult to get developers to come out of the dark. But interestingly enough, that wasn't so much of a problem with this one. When the patrons voted for Thief for our second episode of Greatest Hits, I was filled with both excitement and sheer terror. Thief is one of the most beloved PC games of all time, and there's a lot to dive into when it comes to its design and influence. But it's also impossible to talk about Thief without also exploring the infamous team that created it. Boston's Looking Glass Studios has an almost mythological place in the history of video games, a time and place where some of the most important PC games of all time were created, and a spawning pool for a whole generation of influential creatives. It's due to this infamy that Looking Glass Studios has been covered in retrospectives for decades, and there's a healthy community of archivists who've saved everything from lost content to the final day of the studio. But with any good myth, there are aspects of the story which are more fantasy than fact. Rough edges that have been shaved off, unsung heroes who never got their day in the sun, and the reality of the human cost of creating great art. Over the past three months, I've interviewed dozens of people who worked at Looking Glass, some off the record, some via email, others over Zoom and Discord, all to try and paint as accurate a picture as possible of the work that went on there. We have a lot to cover, from the design of the first three games, to the closing of Looking Glass, the stealth genre mechanics the team invented, and the ones that didn't stick, how the series shifted to Austin, the culture of both studios, and so much more. So, grab your blackjack and get your water arrows nice and wet. We have a lot of taffers to talk to. Danny, I want to tell you ahead of time. Sure. It was a long time ago. Yeah. I have a fairly good memory of, of the high level, but some of the details are really, really vague. Totally. I, I appreciate it. Uh, that's why we're sort of interviewing 10 people instead of two, because the further back you go, the, you know, it, the more labor you put on your interviewee to recall things that are, you know, just too far away. Um, lifetimes ago. 23 years ago or something. <laughs> it's a long time. One thing that was amazing about Looking Glasses was there was a lot of it was a lot of MIT grads, and they really came from. If you read the book Hackers, they described sort of the the founding of, of the hacker community at MIT in the nineteen late nineteen fifties, early sixties, and the first sort of game development coming out of that group of hackers who really had a hackers ethos. They weren't really money driven; they were really making cool cool stuff driven. And there's a ton of guys at Looking Glass, Tim Stelmach and Mark LeBlanc and Doug Church, who are, who have that ethos. And it really formed the heart of the company. And, and I think it really led to their great sense of experimentation. The job I was at, I got offered like a, a partnership at it at a computer consulting firm on Wall Street to stay. And it wasn't even a question. I, I took like a half salary cut and I basically just moved up there, would be there every single day, like till like two in the morning because I just wanted to learn. I just wanted to be around game people. I didn't even know any game people. Like I didn't know gamers at the time. Gaming was not what it is now. So I suddenly found this group of people who was just brilliant and I, I can learn so much from them and they all love games. And so it was like heaven, it was heaven. Ken Levine, like so many of the Looking Glass alumni, has gone on to have a remarkable career, co-founding Irrational Games, creators of System Shock 2, Freedom Force, and the Bioshock franchise. In fact, it was while working on Looking Glass's cancelled Star Trek Voyager game that he and his fellow co-founders originally met. Ken had been a struggling screenwriter in Los Angeles for a few years, a young award-winning writer who was set to go on to do incredible things, until he simply didn't 
Like so many young people who made their way west, his career had gone nowhere, and struggling with creative purpose, he found himself working at a software company to make ends meet. So when the opportunity to head up to Boston and join the studio that had made some of his favourite games appeared, he didn't think twice. After that Voyager game was canned, Ken was asked to create concepts for a brand new game, any ideas that came to his mind. Many of them never got further than his notepad and a few conversations, one or two got a little bit further before being scrapped, and one of them would lay the foundations of a PC gaming classic. No matter the story though, Ken made sure they all had memorable titles. There was one called Split Knuckle, which was a, like a, a martial arts fighting game, but heavily inspired by like Big Trouble in Little China. It was like, it was very, it was very strange and very weird, but fun. Then there was Dark Elves Must Die, which was really about a world where the Dark Elves had gotten a bad rap and they were discriminated against in this world and you were a dark elf. And then there was um, Better Red Than Undead. No, Better Dead, th wait, was it Better Red Than Undead or Better, but basically it was a 1950s, like Cold War spy story where somehow the Russian, the, 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 you know, the Soviets had made an army of undead. And then there was School of Mages, which involved you being able to draw, this would never would have worked, but draw like, use your mouse to draw the shapes of magic spells, like, like oh, wow. the room. It's like Ar Arx Fatalis kind of did something. Yeah, like yeah, that. I think they end up doing something like that. Ken would pitch these games to Doug Church, an MIT grad who had been instrumental in the design of games like Ultima Underworld and System Shock. Doug would warm to some of these ideas and then reject them after deeper thought, sending Ken back to the writer's room with a new blank page. A very frustrating but a very educational process for me because then I'd have to pick myself up the next day and go back into work and basically put the thing I was super excited about aside and basically forever and then come up with something new. But I found I could always go back the next day and I could dig in and find something new. So the next one I got excited about was something called Dark Camelot, another inversion story where Merlin and, and Arthur were actually the villains and you were playing Mordred. Um, and if you know the, the sort of the Arthur ethos, Mordred and Morgana were the villains in that story, but you, they were the heroes in this story. Morgana was, instead of being like a, a, a sort of, you know, a European style, which she was from Africa, you two were made into the villains in that world, but you were actually the heroes. I guess I was caught to these stories where you were sort of unfairly labeled the villain and became the hero. Dark Camelot stuck around longer than many of Ken's ideas. Looking Glass's artist Rob Waters developed concept art for the game, attempting to visualize the world Ken had described. But when they started to make a control scheme that simulated sword fighting, it caused them trouble. They had rudimentary sword fighting in Ultima Underworld, but it didn't have the required precision or player feedback that would make using it immersive. According to storied game developer Warren Spector, this was one of several problems the project suffered from. So when I started, it was uh, it was Dark Camelot, and I, I remember you know reading the uh, the documentation there and thinking the the team really didn't know what game they wanted to make. Uh, beyond the fiction, uh, it really didn't make a whole lot of sense. Doug Church and uh, some other folks were were kind of leading the, the design charge while also writing a bunch of code and working way too hard. And, and so it started making this turn to, uh, to, to more of a stealth game. I, you know, it was kind of a reaction to uh, all the fast paced first person shooters at the time uh, and a desire to, to move away from, from that uh, and offer some unique gameplay. It really came together when uh, Greg Lapiccolo uh, moved from uh, audio exclusively to being the project lead. It, it kind of bounced around and people tried to decide what game they were trying to make. And it was this big democratic team effort uh, and they, they needed someone to, to push them and Greg did a, a great job on that. I saw that, that whole transition from, you know, thinking Better Red Than Undead was one of the wackier proposals I'd ever seen to Dark Camelot with a team that didn't know what game they wanted to make to uh, to what became Thief, uh, finally under, under Greg's direction. 
Warren and Ken are often associated with Thief, but their influence over the project was less direct than most. Warren had been hired by Looking Glass founder Paul Neurath to start a studio in Austin, Texas, a city he had lived in for some time while working at Origin Systems on the Ultima franchise. Warren's role was to be executive producer for all RPGs, and while he shepherded the Thief project through its early days, the financial insecurity of Looking Glass eventually caused him to close the Austin office to help preserve the team in Boston. Ken Levine also left the project after a year, but as you'll come to hear from others, some of the foundational elements he established continue to echo throughout the game's development. I, I can only take very limited credit for this. I get, I think, more credit because being on a game at the, to ship it is really, really important. And the team took what we started with and, you know, really made something very, very special out of it. So um, I don't want to, I don't want to take any undue credit here, but the things I was involved with were, you know, those initial stealth ideas. Um, I, I was very interested and Doug was interested in active stealth. Like, cause I remember that we talked a lot about, there's a moment in Mario 64 where you have to avoid the sleeping plant. And the problem with it was there was a stealth sequence is that you could, there was no way to be actively stealthy. You just had to move slowly. And we want like, so we were beating our brains about how do you make stealth interesting? And I had played a lot of submarine games. In those games, you're very powerful when you're undetected, but you're very weak when you're detected. And that's a dynamic we really want to play with. And so um, in the stealth game, in the submarine games, when you're undetected and you know underwater and using your torpedoes, you're incredibly powerful. But once the enemy spots you, you're in trouble. So you have a bunch of ways to avoid the enemy, like dropping um, noisemakers, going through layers of what they call thermoclean layers in the ocean, because the ocean is actually packed with colder water and then hotter water. You could cross between those layers, and those would hide you if you went into layers of cold water versus hot water. So they had all these tools that made those games kind of fun. So we started thinking about, well, what could you do to avoid detection? Ken had a strong idea of what tone he wanted to achieve. He saw Palmer, the protagonist who would later be renamed Garrett, as a true anti-hero. Not the type of bad guy turned good of contemporary Hollywood, but more like the anti-heroes from the golden age of noir. Bad men like the Maltese Falcon who get dragged into conflicts that are larger than them. A femme fatale comes in with a simple job, and our protagonist is caught between forces that are way out of their control. Thief was beginning to take shape. There, there was a, an interesting moment, and I, I think it was Paul who just stuck his head in the door and said, let's just call it Thief. And at that moment, it was like a light bulb went off. And it gave the team a really solid direction. I mean, one of the, the most powerful things you can do, and I admit I'm very bad at this, uh, is to name a game something that instantly tells players exactly what they're going to do. The title may have told players what this game was about, but it would take a long time for the team at Looking Glass to figure out the game they were making, and that's exactly what we're going to explore now. For those of you who have never played it though, let me give you a brief overview of the gameplay of Thief the Dark Project. At the start of each level in Thief, you're assigned an objective, which usually leads to you invading a private space and attempting to acquire something that's not yours. Here we go. To stay undetected, you have to stay out of line of sight, use shadows to stay hidden, and be careful of how fast you're walking and on what surface that is. Carpets, for instance, way easier to sneak on than tiles. You also have a bunch of tools at your disposal, including swords, a big club that knocks people out, and a selection of fantastical arrows, but we'll get to that later. What's most important here is that you understand that Thief is a foundational game, a game about stealth before there was a stealth genre, before most games had any stealth at all. So not only did the team have to figure out how any of this stuff was going to work, they also had to figure out how they were going to explain to the player how to play a game like this. Tim Stelmach was a designer on Ultima Underworld, System Shock, and Terra Nova, and now he found himself as lead designer on The Dark Project. My role on Thief had both to do with the kind of larger size of the team and the sort of greater need for organization, uh, as well as the fact that project and the entire project itself had gone through several iterations by that point. And uh, some of the initial concept work had been developed there by uh, Ken Levine, of course, and some of the uh, some of the ideas for setting. Uh, you can still see Ken's mark there. 
I remember um, I developed you know, this, this big document about the idea of like being in enemy territory and what, what does that mean and how does that play out in the course of a mission? Like, how do you carve out territory from hostile territory to safe territory? And that's where dynamics around takedowns come in, right? And, and watching patrols and sort of dismantling security, um, which is one of the kinds of dynamics that you can get in self games, right? But not necessarily the only one. Uh, Doug and I had some some deep discussions as well about you know the idea of of maintaining dramatic tension as a tone, about the idea that uh, a lot of the gameplay there is kind of a balancing act, and the implications of that. Like you know, if the player is executing a balancing act, like what happens when he you know drops the ball, right? Keep it so that the the players in that sort of middle zone of trying to trying to keep things keep things under control for as long as possible, right? Like, you don't want, you don't want them too comfortable, and you don't want everything falling apart. It was tricky partly because there was not an established genre there. You know, nowadays, it is easier to include stealth elements, and people kind of know what role to slip into. A lot of people's default assumptions when they sat down to a first-person game, right, is like this is going to be ultra violent, and so we were working against, you know, tr making sure to, to to break you of any notion you might have that 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 was the way things were going to work. But in addition, like just once once we'd established, you know, all right, here's the tone, this is what you're you're expected to do. Again, because a lot of it was uncharted territory, uh, we had just kind of technical challenges. You know, you mentioned you know you could raise an alarm with a guard, but then you know escape and everything would be relatively okay as long as you could clear some distance to him. That itself took some work, right? Like, because our guards could communicate with each other, right? And there's actually further systems in place there to make sure that guards don't use like third hand and fourth hand information, right? So that once the, once the jig is up, like that doesn't just like chain react throughout the entire level. And now like every guard knows you're there, right? That was something that we had to, had to discover. The audio design in Thief was incredibly complex. Guards would chat to each other while footsteps bounced around the level. Audio was used in ways that games had never really done before, and honestly, since. Both in terms of the technology that powered it, and how it was implemented in gameplay. So, how did this come about? And why have we not seen so much of this tech and gameplay in games since? <laughs> Looking Glass was a bunch of MIT grads mostly, right? And so everything was hyper simulation. Don't think you can hide for long. And I think that's why the the sound system worked as well as it did, right? It was it was doing. I mean, for the for the tech of the time, it was really impressive sort of uh, sound occlusion and propagation that um, is kind of commonplace now. <clears throat> The thing that we're, we struggle with with stealth in games even now is audio is really kind of hard uh, to convey state with, right? You know, it's like it's a moment and then it's there, and so it's tricky, right? And to to keep give the player the information they need, and we tried to avoid putting things on the HUD as much as possible, right? To keep that immersion, uh, and we weren't able to do that entirely because obviously there's the light gem and everything like that. But you know, we're trying to avoid it, and uh, audio just is a really it's, it's a tough nut to crack with that. Audio was a big part of the design process in Thief from a pretty early stage, which is very much not the case in a lot of game development. There's a couple reasons for that. You know, one is when we were grappling with, you know, what does it mean to do a game about a thief? One of the points of reference we had was just old school Dungeons and Dragons and like, what is the list of thieves skills? You know, listen at door is on the list, right? It was a real power fantasy in eavesdropping, right? Like people saying things that they would not say if they knew you were there. And when they when that happens, right, like that is a confirmation to the player, right, that, that you have exercised power and autonomy over the situation, right? And that as well gets back to this question of like, well, if you're not running and gunning, like in so many first person games at the time, like what are you doing? And like, what makes you special? But then another reason for that was like, you know, just in the stealth model, and again, in the first person perspective, it poses specific challenges when it comes to maintaining the players awareness of the situation around them to the point where they can make good decisions about how to proceed. 
from today's perspective, we would consider a lot of the decisions driven by, by technical limitations, right? In a, in a modern game, you might have a lot of other options, like a lot of modern stealth games have perhaps you know, vision modes that show you where guards are when they're not in line of sight. Or had we not been in a first person perspective, that problem might not have arisen as much, right? Because you can see the guy who's around the corner. Um, but we had to rely much more heavily on audio just to just to make sure that the player Anything? didn't stumble upon a guard turning around the corner Nothing through no fault of their own, right? And that, so that's a big reason why they why they hum and mumble and whistle all the time. Hmm. Thought I saw something. Hmm. Must have been rats. <coughs> Released around the same time, but but uh, starting development sooner than Thief was uh, Looking Glass's golf game, British Open Championship Golf. And so, if you think about if you think about sports games in general and and sports TV and stuff, like like what keeps golf interesting when you're watching golf on TV, right? Like, because not much is happening, right? But it's the color commentary. So you know that game. Like we got in like Jim McKay to do. Uh, to do some of the commentary on that. Shooting four over in today's round, surely looking for a birdie here. Looking it over. <laughs> Down the fairway. But it meant that we had like this expertise in doing in doing like AI systems for color commentary. Except the guards, instead of commenting on on what the player was doing directly, they just comment on their own AI system. <laughs> But I heard something. But like, that's where it started. Was in was in sportscaster pattern. I love it. Yeah. So the guards are telling you you did a great job getting out of that sand trap, Taffer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they're telling, they're basically telling you stuff like, hmm, I I don't I hear something, but I don't see something, right? Like, <laughs> like they are talking a lot about how you're doing, right? Um, they're just you sort of like framing it as if they don't know that you're there listening. If you guys can't treat me like this, I'm a veteran. <laughs> yeah, I bet that's where you learn to pick pockets so well. W when I got back, my family was gone. I had no money to live. Sure, tell it to the sheriff. He's got a real soft spot for war heroes. The source of Looking Glass's best-in-class audio is rooted in Boston's alt-rock band Tribe. Three of the band's members would come to work at Looking Glass Studios. Bass player Greg LaPiccolo, who was project lead on Thief, Eric Brocious, who was audio lead and composer on the project, and level designer Terry Brocious, who would go on to be creative lead on Thief 3. Her voice is pretty recognisable too, if you listen to Tribe, or have played System Shock. Look at you, hackers. Pathetic creature of meat and bone, panting and sweating as you run through my corridors. How can you challenge a perfect, immortal machine? When I was hired as the junior designer and I was actually there in the building for the first time, my desk was right near Randy Smith and Emil Pagliarulo. And um, I don't know where the other first hired junior designers went, but wherever they went, it was subpar compared to where I ended up. There was no training, you know, it was like, here's Dramed, build something. Emil and Randy were just like, here's a great width for your corridors so that you can have places to hide. Here's, I don't know, stats for you to get, get you started. And every question I had, they were there to answer in a friendly, like non-confrontational -conf way. And then it, I swear, it, it felt like two days. I'm like fiddling around on Dramed when the project lead came over and said, you need to turn that into a level now for Thief Gold. Like it was like, it felt instantaneous. Like, yeah, whatever you're doing, keep doing that and, and turn it into level. And I was like, what the heck? What kind of place is this? But luckily I had played so much Thief and, and sat with Randy and Emil. And that made the difference for me. And then you mentioned Jen Robota, uh, loved her. She was working on some art assets for a forest in one of my levels. And, um, you know, they were tricky objects that would make Dramed, you know, very angry. <laughs> 
you know, I was sort of expecting that she would make me one tree. You don't ask, it's hard to ask for a lot because the artists are so overworked, right? But she made me so many like cool different trees so I could just populate the level and really give it a real woodsy feel. And it was my experience that the artists at Looking Glass were, were like that. They were just, you would ask for one thing, look, I'm trying to build this. Could I just have a, you know, one, you know, book rack? And they'd be like, no, you're, you're getting 10 and you're gonna be happy with the selection. <laughs> From the outside looking in, the Thief Team appears to be an island of misfit toys. You have industry veterans like Warren Spector, wide-eyed failed screenwriters like Ken Levine, and a bunch of people who were in a band together. It's a story we'll hear over and over, and our next interviewee fits that mold too. Dan Thron was a starving artist with no college degree or portfolio to speak of when his friend Glenn had to leave his position at the studio. He recommended Dan. And just like Terry Brocious, Dan found himself in his dream job, and occasionally voicing characters. I did, I did loads of voice work. I did the voice of the eye, I think, and I did uh, like oh God, like a million guard voices, and yeah, I've done a bunch of that stuff. And anytime it's, uh, you know, it's just like, mm, what's that over there? Like, yeah, you've heard me a, a thousand times by now. <laughs> hey, you over there! No, I, I have to get like all the all the early stuff and the, the basic formation of Carrot. That's all Rob Waters, uh, Mark Lazat, and Rob Waters, and they 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 built out the 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 backbone of that world before I got there. I think the reason why art design works so well and the world works so well, the flavor works so well, is because it has this extremely well informed, beautifully designed core of uh, old time fantasy. Uh, that was so well done that nobody had really ever done it at that level. Mark Lazat's like, uh, his knowledge of art history uh, and, uh, and architecture and design uh, built out the entire world. And like my contribution stylistically was to make it as weird as possible between Mark and um, uh, Jen Robota and I and uh, Josh Randall. Uh, you know, like we all came to a sort of a weird combination of very realistic medieval and very, very strange nightmare stuff. One of the, one of the most creative uh, periods of my life and uh, working with those folks are just unbelievable artists. And like, I learned everything that I do now from, from those guys. Like everybody, it was the way we worked at Looking Glass was like so mix and match and everyone's like, everyone is just being excited by everybody else all the time, you know? And so we were all trading ideas, trading story stuff. And with everything to do with Looking Glass, I think everyone will probably reinforce the story. It's just like, we were a bunch of like sleepless, coffee drinking, you know, like unhygienic. <laughs> like we were just committed to this stuff all the time. And whenever you came up with a bizarre idea, you throw it down on paper, you draw it out, or whatever it was. And it wasn't until pretty late in the game uh, that Thief became an organized concept of itself. Right. Um, so the process of making even the cutscenes was like uh, I had. Uh, talked with Ken Levine about like these images and I had experimented with After Effects. So I'd get a, a script from, you know, like you know, Tim and Sarah and all those guys. And like, I would start breaking it down into uh, little Photoshop drawings, little storyboards. And at no point did anyone say like, okay, Dan, you got to direct some cutscenes and get these things done and by this point. Like it was all just, oh shit, I think we need something for the story right here. What if we did something like this? And I was like, you know, hey, yeah, I guess so. And then we'd throw it together. I mean, it was very much like a, um, you know, it's like any sort of college project, you know, it's sort of like, you know, just throw it into a big bag, shake it up and grab what you need. And so like that holistic approach to doing the game is actually, I think what made it so successful you know, across the board from design to everything else.
If you were to ask somebody who played Thief to recollect something about the game, there's a good chance they'll bring up the menagerie of unique weapons and tools, swords, blackjacks, and a variety of bizarre arrows. The sword fighting in Dark Camelot wasn't quite good enough to support a game entirely based around sword fighting, but when surrounded with tools that allowed you to have other ways of engaging with the world, it found its place. In fact, early concepts ended up being a surprising source of inspiration for all these weapons and tools. And so as we gravitated more towards the thief concept, right? Like, okay, a thief does just enough sword fighting that this, that this sword fighting system that we developed seems like it'll work. With that in place, the addition of the blackjack just made sense, right? Like the takedowns and the emphasis on, on operating by stealth to redress the, the fact that uh, at least for, at most people's skill level, like the guards were, were going to win in a, in, a, you know, in a fair fight, a so-called fair fight, right? Mm -hmm. Has someone come? The, like the, the the small selection of arrows that we had in that game, to some extent, like that came out of some early some of the other early concept work. I mentioned uh, Ken Levine's early concept docs, kind of almost steampunk, kind of retro tech kind of concept where we didn't want to have a fantasy world that was just the same as every other fantasy world out there. So he was developing the idea of this kind of retro technology based on uh, on on elemental forces. There were ideas that were only partially expressed in the final game about use of like caged elementals as power sources and whatnot. Um, but part of that then led to brainstorming about like, okay, well, if the if the player has access to these forces, right? Like, what does what does it look like to have the for the player to have the powers of 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 air, earth, water, and fire, right? Um, and you know those are kind of all in the game as as arrows and thief, right? Like you have the earth is the moss arrow and air is the gas arrow and there's a fire arrow, right? And the water arrow is of course the, the most iconic, like associated with thief. Like we put a lot of work into the fact that you'd put out lights, which isn't the most game engines wouldn't let you do at the time. Is it just me or did something move? But I don't think anyone anyone like wait got like how the water arrow was gonna be like the thing that you were carrying around so much of the time. Obviously, you're going to have regular arrows that just have pointy tips, um, and and, uh, and the the noise arrow is just like too useful to not include, right? Let's see, okay, this does not include. This is not. This is this does not fit in our elemental concept. But you know, there's more than enough reason to have it in the game anyway. A lot of the levels were kind of built in tandem as mechanics were coming online, so we kind of had to like change things as we were tuning things. Uh, I know, like for example, the rope arrow if I recall correctly, didn't get added to the game until pretty late in the project, to the point where we had to actually go back to previous levels and find places to tweak things to add um, functionality or like to allow the player to use the robot. I did that in like, the Lost City, for example. There were areas where you could, at one point you could traverse the whole game by jumping and mantling, but then eventually I added like poles that would require the player to use the rope arrow to get higher to get the next section. It's, it's a little hard to, to, to appreciate now like just the difficulty in having skinned meshes in that game at all the idea of like a a polygon mesh that would deform um that was pretty new technology in those days right but like ragdolling a rope was was definitely a lot of work and that system would go haywire many times before it you know finally got to the point where it it behaved itself reasonably well the the water arrow like the, the arrow itself isn't the problem right but the lighting system that like knows how much of the lighting is is attributable to each of the each of the torches and keeps track of that and so there was a whole like different there's a whole separate you know like light map texture patch for every torch in that game which is you know a huge commitment of resources um but it was so integral to the to the game that yeah you kind of had to do it there were different challenges for for the the, the moss era like the other ones were relatively straightforward, like they, you know, they go boom or they, you know, whatever. But, uh, you know, like patching into the system that was otherwise kind of being used for footstep sounds, um, doing all like the sort of animation to make it look vaguely like there was moss growing on the surface. Uh, yeah, definitely, it, was it took some work. I feel like with Thief and the early games back then, there were fewer roles. I mean, I was officially a level designer, a game designer. I think Tim was like the lead designer. 
But um, as a level designer, we were responsible for creating the 3D environment, texturing it, lighting it, scripting AI, pretty much everything you see in the game was mostly the designers had their hands on in some way. Something there. One of the things I liked as a designer doing was using the tools that were provided to us and try to create like interesting ways to actually add new kind of gameplay or new experiences. And one of the things I did in The Lost City was I created these dynamic lights that would were almost like motion sensitive. So as you walked into the room, the, the room would kind of light up and then when you left it would be dim again, which was cool because it allowed me to illuminate areas without lava. And one of the ways that that, that worked also is it allowed the player to know if something's in, in a room without going in the room themselves because the light would go on. So they might be around the corner and in the doorway is dark, but then all of a sudden lights up and they know that there's something in the next room. I thought that was a cool way to kind of convey that information to give the player an understanding of what's there. Or not what's there, but that there is something there. Thief was commercially successful and with Looking Glass in a seemingly constant dance with bankruptcy, the team quickly started working on follow-ups. First came Thief Gold, which added some levels and modified a few others. It too sold well, as word of mouth around this series continued. But development on these games had been challenging. The burdensome workloads required by these projects forced many key staff members to up and leave. So Thief 2 gave the opportunity for some younger talents to step up to the plate. And in doing so, they decided to create a game that was more focused, had fewer monster levels, and instead had different variations on what it was to be a thief. I think that the thing that we identified being most uh, central and important to Thief was the stealth elements and so forth. And we did get a lot of negative feedback from press and from fans and some of, you know, even internally in the team. that like, well, these zombie missions aren't really working and they don't feel like what the, the key thing is. And like bricks where, you know, you just fight them. You don't, you don't have a, it feels weird to blackjack a brick. It's outside the core fantasy and stuff. So we definitely responded to some of that and leaned into a direction of like, well, what we could do that was even more you know, just based around stealth. What can we do to further the fantasy of you being a, a medieval thief in a city or whatever? So that's where things like the bank mission happen, or like robbing a bank. What could be more thiefy than that, you know? And I, I've, been, I've said in the past that I thought we overcorrected to some degree. And I, I think that's because I, in retrospect, a lot of that thinking was correct. But actually what's most important about Thief is the sense of immersion in a plausible world. But you could kind of argue that if we had done combat well and had figured out how to blend that with the with the, the stealth type stuff that maybe those zombie missions or break missions wouldn't have been as bad you know certainly variety is, is a, a big part of what makes entertainment exciting you know and uh my, to my my sense was that thief 2 pushed so hard in the direction of stealth that we lost a couple things we lost a little bit of the variety and, and also i think we in lost a little bit of story credibility in Thief 2. Uh, we tried to, we really were a mission first design in Thief 2. And we were like, well, a bank would be a great mission. And you know, rooftop sounds like an amazing mission. And Terry's got this amazing idea that's gonna be great for a pagan village. And, and then the, the challenge after was like, so how do you weave a story through all this stuff? In some ways, Thief 2 felt like just a continuation of, of Thief 1 and Thief Gold, where we rolled pretty directly into working on the project and applying a lot of the same principles, uh, partly because, you know, Thief had only become aesthetically successful at what it was trying to do pretty late in development. In a, in a case like that, you, you definitely find yourself looking at the possibilities of the sequel. It's like, okay, now that we know what we're doing with this thing, you know, let's see if we can do it, right? There was, in that sense, a lot of continuity. Um, in another sense, there was, there was, you know, there was an attempt to not just be samey, and that, that partly expressed itself in like the kind of stories that we're trying to tell. And partly it was just the focus of mission design uh, where we much more narrowly focused in on, on burglary scenarios. Uh, thief was much more exploratory in terms of like, well, what could a thief be? You know, when we narrowed in on like, all right, we're, we think that this is gonna be much more just about, about stealth and intrusion. But then if you look at, at Thief 2, the focus on maintaining variety there in terms of like, okay, well, like, what are all the different things that burglaries can be, right? In Thief 2, there's like, you're breaking in in order to like do a bank job or to case the joint or to frame a guy or to kidnap someone or to, right? Like this whole list of whole list of crimes as opposed to just like, but like all burglary crimes, right? And so we were trying to settle into what we saw as, as like the, the strong suit that we, we developed. 
In general, I think people people uh, that was successful. Like I, my my understanding is that that the consensus is like a, like a, a lot of people uh, thought that that Thief Two was the more kind of mature, polished version of the game. Though there's 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 disagreement there, right? Like Thief One is more adventurous in what it, what it's trying to do, and so there's more kind of variety and surprise. So and you know those those opinions are both correct, just for the different people who have to hold them. <clears throat> Some Looking Glass Studios has a sort of mythological presence in the story of video games, the type of place that every young creator dreams of working at, and every aging creative wants nothing to do with. A place where ideas were discussed and fought over, where the hours were arduous and long, where people were smart and devoted to their craft. But I wanted to get to the truth of what it was to work in this place back then, the reasons why people left, and the reasons why people stayed. Thief is an expression of, uh, like the world of Thief is an expression of where we, how we were living our creative lives together. Very open and very sharing and uh, very driven. You know, people were working ridiculous hours, choosing to work ridiculous hours because they were uh, committed to it. And, you know, I've since worked, you know, a long time in the visual effects industry and movies and stuff like that. Like, I think that corporations saw that people, oh shit, they'll work incredible hours, like super duper hours. So well, let's just plan on that. And then we'll make that part of the process. I'm just like, that's not why we're, we're not doing it for you. We're doing it for the work, for the beauty of the work. And like the reason why, you know, I would go to Looking Glass at three in the morning to do new stuff and I would find six other people there you know uh, is because they were in love with work they were in love with working with each other and we were addicted to that uh, constant communal inspiration like I said I mean everything was a challenge uh, up to and including uh, a team that absolutely killed itself I and mean, that was you want to talk about the definition of crunch holy cow there were people sleeping under their, their desks all over the place. There was one time I was looking for something uh, in Doug's office and I opened up his the drawer and there were half a dozen paychecks in there. You know, he didn't even have the time to cash his check. From everyone we've talked to, no one, everyone has said like, yes, we worked our asses off. Yes, it was probably unhealthy, but I would have fucking done it. 10 times over again like it yeah, was absolutely so, so what was it about the the what is it then that is that didn't feel exploitative about it because because we're choosing to well, like this is what we wanted to do this is us you know this is something like i mean like you shouldn't work for a company that demands you work 80 hours a week ever like no just forget it just quit do something else better work at starbucks than to ever have to do that like you should never be required to do that. They should never build business models around that kind of stuff. But like, if you like, if you were the person who didn't turn up on the weekends, you didn't feel like you would have been like castigated for it, or or you would have been outside of the the culture no, or anything. No, like that. no, no. There's no there's no like emotional pressure put at any level. Like we were on we were in love with this thing. Like that's it. I mean, like me, you could turn in a you know eight hour day and no, we'd still all hang out and do good work. It doesn't make any difference. You know, uh, but like the people would be there because we we were in love, you know, and like, like uh, and that's the only reason to ever work that hard, like because then then it is not work. Like I I still work this hard all the time on my own stuff. I'm not gonna like I don't want anyone coming in and saying, I'm sorry Dan, you know it's two o'clock in the morning. You can't do any writing now. That's that's not like that's I'm just like screw off, man. I'm gonna be doing this my whole life. This is, this is what I love. I'm going to do it whenever it hits me. And with Looking Glass, it hit us all the time because we were around those people. I mean, yeah, sure, it's unhealthy. <laughs> but like, it's more unhealthy to be unartistic. Yeah. But don't ne never, ever work for companies that make you do this, ever. Zero. Both Eric and I were there. So that made it easier. It's like, no, my husband's right there, you know, in case we want to get a pizza or something. And there were no kids at home. Now we were younger back then. I couldn't, it was unsustainable, obviously. I, I, I couldn't do that now, but it was fun. And the people were smart and funny. And, and so it was a pleasure to be around them. You know, I'm not sure anybody ever said, yeah, you have to crunch. Um, it's just that we did.
it was a, a lovely culture and a lovely group of folks. There was a lot of mutual respect. There was a lot of uh, capabilities. And, you know, like you said, uh, there were folks that were MIT grads and, and super geniuses. Um, and then there were people like me and Dan who, you know, kind of like just showed up and sat around until we got paid. But because of that mutual respect, there was a, a really strong culture at Looking Glass of, of consensus, right? They would talk things out you know, to make sure everybody was on board as much as possible before moving forward uh, to the point where I think actually um, that slowed things down. And while it ended up with, you know, a lot of really great games and, you know, stuff that people were really passionate about, uh, it also really drew out a lot of the, uh, the design. But it was definitely a place where you got a job because you could do the job and not what you had done before, or where you came from, or what your degree was. Uh, and that was really cool. It wasn't a corporate place. We would get into like, there were people felt strongly about their opinions, and there was robust debate going back and forth. But we also had like design meetings where we would just talk like about a design topic. And we'd sit there and we'd get into it. And we would just, we were just so passionate. It was really like my whole life. One thing that I, I, I that I, I think is really noteworthy about the team on on Thief and on Thief 2 is just the extent to which those teams developed a lot of talent. In many cases, like their, it was their first job in that kind of work. And you know, Randy Smith just like a sort of cold called Greg LaPiccolo. Uh, Emil Pegliarulo had worked in the press before that, right? He was, he was a, a, in the gaming blogs. Uh, Mike Krasnowski worked at GameStop. Uh, you know, Sarah Varelli had worked for us before in, in Playtest for a long time and tried to quit Looking Glass for various reasons. And we were like, wait, hold on. Sarah's not happy? I didn't know. We have to hire her back as a designer. And, you know, she ended up, you know, being lead on Thief Gold. And, you know, a lot of those people, you know, they just have just gone on to, to do such tremendously great work elsewhere in the games industry. You know, like, that process and being open about your individual creative process and sharing it with everybody only like that's how you make things greater than you could make individually you know and that was the process of looking glass that's why so many people there went on to incredible things you know like it's just a it's bizarre how many uh brilliant minds were together in that space it, it was a remarkable place i mean it, it was it was a little like origin where you, you felt like you were going to change the world. I mean, legitimately change the world. And Looking Glass was, was a lot like that. On the flip side, uh, I think, you know, we contributed to a changed world. I don't want to overstate um, through influence, not exactly through sales. And so Looking Glass was pretty constantly in, in dire financial straits. And a lot of people just couldn't deal with that. So, you know, people left. The, the Dark Camelot team just fell apart. Um, and the, the Thief team was uh, largely a new team. But I, I got to say, Looking Glass, one way or another, uh, figured out how to hire the right people. A lot of them came right out of MIT. There was a definite MIT uh, culture up there. And so they got lots of really good people. It was a great group. It had its own culture, its own language, its own way of dressing, um, its own viewpoint on what games could and should be. If you're lucky in your life, in your career, you get to work with one great group. But the Thief team was definitely one of those great groups. It was remarkable. I left, I left Looking Glass because... Um, to be honest, I was worried. I, I was so terrified of, of, I had this opportunity for this creative life and I had, I had blown it once. And I was worried about the company as a financial organization. Um, and I loved what they did. I adored what they did and they created really the formative games for me. But they, like I said, they weren't they, it wasn't really a business oriented company because they really came from this hacker ethos of that, you know, that was found in the, in the, in the 60s. That was it. That was really about hacking and creating cool things and um, not necessarily about running a, 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 a business that can last a very long time. So I wondered if I could 
start a company that could take the sort of the design ethos that I cared about, but maybe have sustainability because I was terrified of that company closing down and losing my job. Oh, you saw that. I was hemmed up on the table. Uh, 12 in. Hemmed up. Hemmed up. 12 in. Looking Glass was gone, but it cast a long shadow, leading to the creation of new studios, new franchises, and an ethos of gameplay design we've come to know as immersive simulations. After Warren Spector closed Looking Glass's Austin studio, he founded an Austin office for Ion Storm, the studio in nearby Dallas that had been formed by ex-id software developers Tom Hall and John Romero. It's here at Ion Storm Austin that Warren would create his dream game, Deus Ex. By the time Looking Glass had closed, Eidos had bought the majority stake in Ion Storm, had closed the Dallas headquarters, and was now shopping around a sequel to Thief. I, I had a proposal called Shooter that I started working on in 1995. There was a point on, on Thief the Dark project where, again, I was sitting with the team and I, I had been playing a build and I just said, look, it's, I, I'm not good enough at sneaking. And they, they said, uh, well, if we let you fight, all you'll do is fight. That's what players will do if you put a sword in there. And I, I, I sat there and said, I'm going to show these guys <laughs> that you can actually make a game where you can fight, sneak, and talk. And so that's where Deus Ex came from. Later on at Ion Storm, IDOS knew they wanted uh, a sequel to Deus Ex, so that's where Deus Ex and Visible War got started. But there was one day I got a call from uh, IDOS saying, we're gonna make a, a new Thief game. We've found a developer to do it. And I said, no way. And I had some folks from Looking Glass, uh, including you know Randy Smith and, and others who had worked on the Thief games. With that foundation, I just said, get out of my way. Ion Storm is going to make that. And out of that came, uh, you know, Deadly Shadows. Before Looking Glass had shut down, Randy Smith and Terry Brocious were put in charge of a third Thief game. Randy had been toying with the idea of creating a multiplayer Thief experience, but this project was killed pretty early on. When Randy was employed by Warren to work on Thief 3, he assumed it would be as senior designer. But much to Randy's surprise, Warren had other ideas. I felt a little bad because I was spending so much time running the studio um, and and trying to keep my eye on, you know, 200 person teams. And so I, I, I kind of said, all right, I've, I've had my day in the sun. Uh, it's time to, to start helping other people make their mark and make their games. I, I said, Harvey, you've been, Harvey Smith, you've been lead designer uh, on, on Deus Ex. Um, he, he worked on System Shock as the QA lead. I brought him into my producer group at Origin where he did some production and design. I said, Harvey, it's, it's, it's your turn. Be, be a game director. And similarly, Randy Smith had been a lead designer for a while. You know, he deserved a shot and understood Thief as well as anybody on the planet. And so we, we built a team um, that was partly Looking Glass, partly Ion Storm, partly new. Yeah, and so I was assuming I was going to get involved as a designer, and I was hopeful that I could be like a senior designer or lead designer, and it's probably like the the move I was ready for in my career. And instead, I was like, you know, kind of totally astonished when Warren was like, because I remember we were somewhere and and Warren was talking to the team. He's like, and if Randy's willing to step up, this and that will happen. I'm like, yeah, lead designer. But then later it was like project director, and I was like, whoa, that's like two very big steps at once, you know, and I was I was young, I was like 26 probably, you know, and then then it was my job, I think, to try to recruit as many other uh, looking glass folks to, that would come over as possible. We got kind of a, a few too, we got um, Alex Duran, we got Emil Pagliarulo, and more, we got we got quite a few people, and we continue to work with Eric Brocious and Terry Brocious and, and lots of good folks. I remember going into Thief 3 with IDOS at Ariad Storm, and um, we, yeah, we had a lot of, of goals in front of us. So we were gonna make a PC game that was faithful to the franchise. And I give credit to everybody that, that was an important goal. You know, I, I don't know if I would have signed on if they were like, we're gonna milk the franchise for all it's worth. You know, so, so it was cool that one of the things we had to do was like, this is a legitimate third installment of this trilogy. Cause we, we planned it from looking glass from the beginning as a trilogy. Um, but we also needed to be on consoles. This is a, like, you know, prior to this, it was like a PlayStation one was a console. So the idea that a game like thief would be on a console was very new. And the Xbox was the reason that our team felt like we could do that. Right. It was like, Hey, this isn't that much of a leap, uh, at least in terms of the way you approach development. Um, 
obviously later on it turned out to be trickier than that, right? And in a lot of what comes with that is like, uh, hey, how can we approach not a more mainstream market per se, but like have a game that's not necessarily, isn't unnecessarily high friction, you know, like what's a, what's going to be the, the feel good way to hold the controller control with Garrett. You know, there's times in the original Thief series where you just feel like your fingers are on like every key at once in the mouse. And it's like, there's just so much to do. And we just wanted to be like, could you also, could, instead of just playing the game like this, could you play the game like this and, and have it be, and have equal power in controlling your character. Essentially, you know, Thief 1 and 2 were created by hardcore gamers, hardcore developers who didn't mind how complicated the game was. Like that was our bread and butter, we, we soaked in it. And we made a game for people like us. And I, there was explicit direction from, from Midas, like don't just make a game for you, also make a game for some more players so we can sell it to them. But everything I've just described is already a lot to do. And I, when we got in development, there were some other curveballs that came our way. So one was that I was really pushing, one of the things I was pushing for is what I call body awareness, which is this idea that instead of being this floating camera, which is the way first person games have been from that, from that point so far, you could like look down and see your hand, you know, you see your feet. And if you're climbing a ladder, you can see your hands. And when you're picking a lock, you can see your hands. Our, you know, one of the principles of looking glass was immersion, feeling like you're actually embodying this character you're playing. And I thought that was going to add a lot of immersion. It comes with a lot of risk because suddenly there's a fidelity question. And what if the blackjack doesn't quite look right? And, and I was like, so it's a, it's a big project, but let's go for it. Let's actually just like have this work. And uh, unfortunately, this sort of backfired on me. And as much as we got that going, and everyone's like, that's so cool. We're pretty much finished third person. We could just do first and third person piece of cake, you know? And somebody made the prototype where you can push a button and the camera comes out and you can see our character we're running around. And it's like, we just make the model look better. And this is gonna be easy. And I was like, no, it's not. We still have to do all the body awareness stuff. And then we have to come out and see this character in third person. We have to see them interact with the environment. We have to see, this is a stealth game. So when they're in shadows, what do they look like? When they're not in shadows, what do they look like? When they're climbing a rope arrow, when the rope arrow is weirdly tight with the ceiling, what's that gonna look like? You know, like uh, our game had so much freedom. All the Thief games had so much freedom in terms of movement that suddenly like the idea that we would just pull the camera out and this character would just be fine. You could totally ship that. Was I knew that was, was not gonna happen that way. Then, okay, so there's a new engine. We hadn't worked with Unreal very much. And there was some excitement about our programming staff and art staff, which is very well intentioned. And a lot of this was good. And it's one of the reasons the game is successful. But the idea was like, let's make the game look even better. Let's replace Unreal's renderer and do this other thing. And we're gonna have dynamic lighting and this and that feature that were fancy and cool, which is great. That's all cool stuff. But like now we're starting to see all these like issues start to compound. It's like, we're a team that's supposed to be developing this stuff. Uh, we're directed by some people in their early 20s, you know, like, uh, you know, we weren't the primary projects on at Ion Storm, like Deus Ex clearly got the, you know, there was times when they would come and cannibalize like half of our department, our design department, our engineering staff, and then we'd be sort of like, you know, on a shoestring budget for some months until they kind of came back or whatever. So there was just a lot for us to deal with. And then the Xbox came in back and bit us in the butt. We're late stage after all this technology development we were working on. It was like, Oh, right. And um, by the way, our, our maps don't fit in memory and they never will. We had been developing these these maps for months, years, probably, you know, where, and this is a lot of what I was focused on. I was, as again, I was like over-focused on design as a director. I didn't understand a lot of what the other parts of the director's job were. Would have been a better lead designer. I wasn't quite ready for that job of, of being a director, but I was anyway, right? And so I, I spent a lot of my time with the level designers just sort of like, going over their levels and we'd played them in all different ways and we had like known what kind of affordances would happen and the guard patrols down long hallways and all this stuff and we had to reduce the size of our levels and then chop them into like threes and fours uh, and so that just like was a huge impact to our gameplay right it's like if you have it's, it's hard to even imagine but if you're a designer and you've made this like perfect map it's like okay now what i want you to do is figure out where you're going to draw lines that doesn't disrupt your design like there is no such thing our, our, our levels are very seamless like if you were in one corner of the level, you might still be monitoring your camera in the other corner. You might have left a trap for a guard, you know, and that you time that correctly with the patrol route. You might, you know, we had these really awful things where a guard's chasing you down the hallway, but here's the, you know, here's the, the teleportation zone between the levels. And it's like, well, this totally breaks the immersion. Like what's gonna happen? I'm pretty sure we did teleport the guards over and carry them. And so, but that's kind of a, an awful crutch to sort of a, a glaring problem. So we were just really saddled with a lot of issues. In, in, in a smarter development, you would have gone through all this in pre-production before you had you know, opened the fire hose of hiring all of your designers and artists and stuff. And you'd be like, you wanna come out of pre-production saying like, here's our engine, here's what we can do, here's the constraints, make your map smaller. Or at that time say like, maps being smaller is not an acceptable compromise, so that's not what we're doing. We're, we're not gonna use this render, we're not gonna use this solution or whatever. And we didn't do that. We were just, you know, we were making it up as we went. <laughs> I do think Looking Glass had a unique feel and culture. And when I was working on 
um, with Randy. I've always enjoyed working with Randy and he's always made every situation work, but still I was remote. So I was still in Boston and the team was in uh, Aust Austin, Boston and Austin. And uh, I would fly out there occasionally, but I didn't have the same rapport with the rest of the team. I found it hard to, because I'm an introvert, I found it hard to get to know people. So I didn't quite have that same, yeah, I'm on this team and it's exciting and we're bouncing ideas off each other. Finding the story was tricky, but I'm proud that we found a story where the keepers have decayed and in, in a way that you know, seemed to make sense and left Garrett alive at the end. Um, set, I think we were trying to set up for a fourth game with maybe a different protagonist. There was a lot of back and forth with Randy and I, um, you know, talking about different scenarios. And I'm, I'm proud that we, uh, that we found our solutions. The project went pretty well. It needed more direction than frankly, I, I was uh, able to give it. And so I brought in uh, some production talent notably uh, Paul Weaver, super talented. You know, he's sort of like Doug Church, a, an unsung hero of gaming. And he really helped Randy and the team uh, push that, that game over the finish line. It was definitely a great team. Again, I think it needed a little bit more direction than it, it was getting. Um, and I'll, I'll take the blame for that. But once Paul came on, that, that game cruised and, and you know, a lot of people think it, it wasn't up to the standards of the first two games. I, I think it's it's an underrated game. I think it's pretty swell and, and a little prejudiced. Jordan Thomas is, you know, the, the Shelbridge Cradle mission. It's a classic. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I love Deadly Shadows. I think we, the team did an amazing job. I think the game, like I see screenshots of the game. It's been, you know, I have played it hardly at all since the day, you know, we shipped it and then I left the team or whatever. And like, I see screenshots, I'm like, that looks really cool. I wonder what that is, you know, like, I mean, my, my experience is sort of like, I came into Thief 1 and a lot of the important foundations of the series were already established. And I did a very good job as a level designer, like bringing those to life on, you know, the stages that were the levels. Um, so, you know, I, someone gave me the paints and I got to paint a cool picture and that was great. Um, but they, they did a lot of that work. And then in Thief 2, I feel like, as I said previously, like we did a lot of stuff super right. The stealth is much more carefully, you know, refined. Uh, the, the emphasis is on the stealth in a way that's very smart. But I felt we lost a little bit of the magic of the world and a little bit of the immersion and the sense that you really are in a believable place doing believable things and a little bit of that variety. And so I'm really gratified when I hear people talk about Thief 3 and they say like, oh, it, it really brings some of that back. Like the story is, a, is, a, is really well done and it's a good ending. It's like, cool, like I'm glad to know that that worked for people, you know? Eidos still owns the rights to Thief, and while they've enjoyed success with their reboot of the Deus Ex franchise, the 2014 reboot of Thief had a tougher time with critics and fans. Thief seems like a franchise which is destined to live in the past, a product of a very particular era in game design, a flavor of game that is the direct result of a very particular creative chemistry. Looking Glass Studios burnt bright and so burnt out fast, but its long shadow still affects the games we play today. Be it the latest FPS that has a stealth mode, immersive sims from studios like Arcane, or designers who are still inspired by the gameplay of those early titles today. It's almost impossible to quantify just how much of an impact that studio and this series has had on the games we play today. And for all that, we can thank a ragtag group of mathematicians, artists, musicians, and screenwriters, the names we've come to know, and the many unsung heroes. A group of people who peered through the looking glass to see a new path for video games, and crucially, stepped through.